And then Philippians 4. Okay, this topic this morning we have all failed at. We all struggle with it every single day. And uh, I'm not going to say that you're going to get it right until the day you see Jesus Christ. It's just something tough. It's dealing with your thought life. It's about like trying to herd birds. Okay, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3, and then Philippians 4. Okay, 2 Corinthians 10, verse 3, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. And then notice the next one, casting down imaginations. How's your imaginations? And every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ and having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Okay, the disobedience is, verse 5, failing to cast down imaginations. Okay, so that's, that's our thought life. Now, if you would, in Philippians 4... Philippians 4, verse 4. This says, Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing. Okay, if I have an altar call, you know, set up a confessional booth, how much we got to confess on that one right there. Be careful for for nothing. That means be full of care. The modern catch word would be worry, but the Bible word is better. Be careful, full of care for nothing. But in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God, and the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. You know anybody that's lost their mind? Okay, peace of God, it's a peace of mind. And then verse 8, finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, that discredits the fake news media, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, Whatsoever things are lovely, that's a word we don't use much in our culture. Australia, it's, they use it a lot. That's lovely. That, that would, we'd say that's nice, that's good. They'd say it's lovely. That's how they use the word. Um, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. That's a command. That's a command like thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not, so forth and so on. Think. Okay, there's, there's what our thought life. Okay, verse 8, I would say, if I had to raise a hand, how many did you fail in that yesterday? Day before, day before, day before, this morning. Okay, that, that's a toughie to think on these things. Those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the God of peace shall be with you. Okay, let's go ahead and pray. Lord, I do pray. This is impossible to obey these things uh, in the flesh. It's just totally impossible. We can't do it. And I pray that you'd help us to re- realize that uh, I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. And that's within the context of telling me what to think about, what to allow my mind to uh, think on, comprehend, uh, meditate on. And I pray you'd help us to realize Obviously, the difficulty of this, but also the vital uh, knowledge of this, of knowing how to uh, have how to control our thought life. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Okay, uh, if you're Philippians, go to Colossians three, verse fifteen, real quick. Okay, so these two passages talks about our thought life. Okay, and um, people, you know, don't realize that there are words or thoughts floating through the air. As we're sitting here, there are communications all going through the air. 
okay, uh, television programs through the air and radio broadcasts. And then if you got the right receiver, you could pick up on it. Okay, phone conversations and all those things. Now, a lot of the phone conversations are going through the wires, okay, but still all these things, and then these things are just, uh, words are like birds with wings. Okay, and these thoughts will come into our mind. And this is why if you're riding along with somebody and one person says, they bring up a topic and, and you maybe said, you know, I was just thinking about that. You ever have that experience? I know my dad and I did a lot. When we're going from field to field, he'd bring up, you know, I was just thinking about that. And what that is is this thought come flying through, like birds flying through, and you both picked up on the thought. He verbalized the thought, but you had the thought. But it's going through. Now, in 2 Corinthians, it says, cast down imaginations. These are things that we imagine. You have no evidence in many cases, but we imagine it, and a person's thought can really take it out there. Now, if a person keeps dwelling on a similar a thought that is a thought that's no evidence, but it can drive a person crazy. Okay, in Colossians 3.15, And let the peace of God rule in your hearts as your heart thinks. Okay, let it rule in your hearts to the which also ye are called in one body and be thankful. How do you know that you have the peace of God? At the end of the verse, it's because a person is grateful. They have a heart of gratitude. Thoughts can debilitate an individual and destroy them. Can actually destroy them. Uh, I have a friend that lives in Fairbanks, Fairbanks, Alaska, preacher up there. And he said there are people that are dime a dozen that are um, up there who are sociopaths or psychopaths uh, or narcissists because they're stuck in their house during these cold weathers and they run these thoughts through their mind over and over and over and then they believe their thoughts. And it doesn't matter what you tell them. Don't confuse me with the facts. I've got my mind made up. Okay, and the reason why is they've allowed these thoughts just to fester. Okay, like I mentioned, words are spirits with wings. Okay, as I'm expressing words, a spirit has come out of my mouth. It put wings to the words going into your mind. Now, sometimes the words are twisted before they get to your mind. You ever say something to somebody and it did not say anything what you said? The words got twisted from your mouth to their ears. In their heart, they twisted them. In their mind, they heard you say, yeah, you said that. No, I didn't. Yes, you did. I did not. Let's play the tape. But who's got that available? So words are spirits with wings. And then when you assemble these words together, they become thoughts. And these thoughts are like a flock of birds that fly Now, to control your thoughts, especially in your natural realm, is about like you trying to flock together, harness these birds together and get them all in a cage. And you know how hard that would be. Now, you may not prevent a bird landing on your head, but you can prevent it from building a nest on your head. Okay, you not are are held accountable for the thoughts that came into your mind. But you are responsible of what you do with a thought. Where 2 Corinthians 10 says, cast down imagination. You imagine some things. Now, people that allow these thoughts to just fester and fester and they keep thinking about it, it can destroy that individual. Okay, and then you have all these phobias nowadays. And some of them are thought phobias where people don't want to leave their house. Okay, and so what do we do with these things? Now, every, all of us, you've got to admit, all of us have difficulty with our thought life. All of us have disobeyed Philippians 4, 8, and he gives the list. Whatsoever things are true, honest, just, pure, lovely, good report, that's our limitation to think on things. The idea is to allow them to dwell in us. Now, Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all things through Christ which strengthened me. That means that within that context, the writer, the writer that writing this is in jail writing this. Paul is in prison writing these words, 
And in prison is where a guy's mind just runs away with them. Those guys that get on the phone and call the wife and control the wife from the prison, and his mind is just running away from them. Now, he's got no evidence. It's in his imagination. He's thinking they're doing this and thinking they're doing that and thinking they're doing this, thinking they're doing that. No evidence of it. And his mind is running away from him because that's all he can do is think. Okay, and so the one who gave us the uh, promise in verse, verse 13, I can do all things through Christ, the only one that obeyed verse 8 of all those things his entire life is Jesus Christ. Okay, so I'm going to give you some thoughts about this morning, the idea of our thought life. The first thought is this, to fret, worry, or to be troubled is evidence that a person does not have a peace of mind. Okay, we don't have a peace in our mind. A believer is to have a peace of mind. Okay, it doesn't matter what the news media says. It doesn't matter what's going on. We should recognize that God is in control as far as society, as far as his plan is concerned. And God has the believer's best interest at heart. Okay, and that should give us peace. Fret in the Bible is similar to our word worry. The word worry is not in the Bible at all. Okay, if you would, Psalms 37 will run across the word fret. Psalm 37, verse 1, it says, Fret not thyself because of evildoers. Neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity, for they shall soon be cut off or cut down like the grass and wither as a green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. So shalt thou dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Commit thy way unto the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. He shall bring forth thy righteousness as the light and thy judgment as the noonday. Rest in the Lord. And wait patiently for him. Fret not thyself because of him who prospereth in his way, because of the man who bringeth wicked devices to pass. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not thyself in any wise to do evil. So there's the command where we see what's going on, okay, and then we get all anxious about things of what, this guy's getting away with murder and this one's getting away with this and they're doing this. Don't worry about it. God sees the picture. Okay, so fret or troubled. Let's try the word troubled, okay? Second Thessalonians chapter 2. Second Thessalonians chapter 2. A lot of times people get troubled. Okay, what if Hillary would have got in office? Oh, Christians would be ballistic. You know? Why? Because they're trusting too much in something that's not something to be trusted in. Okay? They're putting too much trust in a political figurehead. Our trust is in the Lord. Second Thessalonians 2, verse 1, he says, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by your gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter, as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. A few letters later, 1 Peter chapter 3 uh, Bush, uh, Bush number two, President Bush number two, is a guy that coined the phrase, or at least it became well known in his administration, the word terror. Terror, 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 terrorism. That's a Bible prophecy. The Bible prophesied about these things, okay? And this idea of terror and all this stuff. Okay, in second, in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 14, it says, but... And if ye suffer for righteousness' sake, notice the command. If you suffer for righteousness' sake, the writer had to be a nutcase, did he not? 
If you suffer for righteousness' sake, the writer says, happy are ye. But that's not our response, is it? The writer says, if you suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye. What are you, a nutcase? You've got to be in a mental ward or something. And then he says, be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you a reason of the hope that's in you with meekness and fear. Now, there are two areas in life you are never to worry about. Okay? One is things that you can affect or control. And the other are things that you cannot affect or control. Meaning, we should never worry. Right? Or fret or be troubled. But most of the things that you and I would have to admit, if you live long enough, most of the things that you were troubled about or worried about did not come to pass. Right? But fear can de debilitate a person to travel. Well, I'm afraid to get hit by a car, so don't get in a car. Well, then you're not going to go anywhere. But fear can do that to people. And then you got, oh, this is another phobia, and another phobia, and another phobia. Uh, panic. I know a young fellow that was a fighter. I mean, he was a street fighter, fighter. I mean, he could help himself in any situation. And then he'd have panic attacks. I'm thinking, you got panic attacks? You know, about some emotional thing that he really had a hard time with? I mean, this is a guy that wouldn't rat out anybody in prison, but he gets in court, he rats me out. Because I gave him a document to help him get out of jail quicker than he should have. <laughs> the judge got mad about it. Okay, cowardice can debilitate somebody from witnessing. Why do most Christians don't witness? It's because you're afraid to. Okay, it's, a, it's an unhealthy fear. Self-love will drive an insane person to his safe zone. Oh, I feel safe here. Yeah, and these people are just nuts. They're insane. They're madly in love with themselves. So the first idea is to fret, worry, or to be troubled is evidence that a person doesn't have a peace of mind. The second thing, a bitterness of soul overcame Esau, which forfeited a blessing from God. Okay, remember the story of Esau and Jacob in the Old Testament? Esau's dad wanted to give Esau a blessing. God said Jacob's going to get the blessing. And then uh, Jacob's mom, she, got, she lost faith and she finagled that thing. And then the blessing went to Jacob. Okay, originally God said it's going to Jacob. That's where God was going to have it go to Jacob. If she would have not lost faith, God would have had it gone to Jacob without any finagling. But she finagled. And then Esau felt like he got cheated out of the blessing. Hebrews chapter 12 says that he, he became bitter over that. Hebrews 12, verse 16, or 15 Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled, lest there be any fornicator or profane person, as Esau, who for one mor morsel of meat sold his birthright. For ye know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. Uh, Esau allowed that thing to fester, he wanted to kill his brother. Okay, the storyline is that his mom knew that the blessing was going to Jacob. The dad was going to bless the boys, and he wanted the blessing to go to Esau. She lost faith. She finagled a thing. She pulled the wool over his eyes. Okay, and the thing smelled funny to his dad, all that stuff. And the blessing went to Jacob. Esau got mad on it. He wanted to kill Jacob. And mama said... You better go to your cousins uh, for a year or two because Esau is really mad at you. And you know what? His mom never saw him again. He ended up going for 20 years. If she would have known, right? If she would have known. But that bitterness is what ate Esau up. It's like a cancer that ate him up. Okay, bitterness of soul will eat a person from the inside out. Why? They keep thinking about it, and they keep thinking about it, and they keep thinking about it, and they run it through their mind, and they think about it, and they think about what he did to me, what he did to me, what he did to me. And that's a cancer that rose up in him, and bitterness of soul will just eat a person. 
And that's what happened to Esau. He forfeited the blessings of God because he just kept harboring that thing. His thought life. Third idea, most of our thoughts lack evidence of reality. I know how the devil plays. You know, okay, a man and a woman, okay, if either work, both are working outside the house, it doesn't matter, or one's working in the house, doesn't matter either way. Okay, they're both apart from each other. About 30 minutes before they see each other, a thought will come in the mind of him, oh, she's flirted with somebody. A thought will come in her mind, oh, he's probably flirted with somebody. And then they harbor that thought. Now, they got no evidence, casting down imaginations. But if they run that thought through and keep running it through, now when they see each other, instead of lovingly glad to see each other, is, what did you do today? And where do those thoughts come from? There's a little imp in the corner that threw that thought in there. And then he get fighting, and he's in the corner getting a big chuckle out of it. What happened? We didn't cast down imagination. You will say, you say, well, what if they would? Wait till you get the evidence. Why, why waste an emotional thing on something you don't have to waste it on? <laughs> okay, and this is what's called, the Bible calls this evil surmisings. 1 Timothy chapter 6, we've all done it. Evil surmisings. 1 Timothy 6 verse 4 says, He is proud, knowing nothing, but doting about questions and strifes of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings. Surmising is when you suppose evil of another, but you don't have the evidence. You don't see it, you didn't hear it, you didn't smell it, you didn't do anything. And that's, that's evidence of a lack of charity, because charity thinketh no evil. This is towards the loved one. Okay, and this is what Jesus Christ pointed out in Matthew chapter 9, because he could read their minds, which why are you thinking this evil? Now, this is human nature. Okay, these thoughts lack evidence. Okay, if you have a thought, you've got to tell yourself, okay, what evidence do I have? Do I have any evidence? No evidence. Throw it out. Don't even dwell on it. Don't waste time with it. I mean, you can only think of one thought at a time. Well, guys can. A lot of times they can't even think of a thought at a time. Women, they can think about five at a time. And they don't understand. We, we, when we get in our nothing box, I like to stay in my nothing box. Okay, but here's what we need to do. We need to look at the evidence. And if there's no evidence, cast it down. Okay, what if we get a thought and it's none of your business? A lot of people like to pry in other people's business, don't they? They got all the suggestions. You know, all these guys, these sports commentators, especially the ones who've never played a sport and they're commentating on a sport. It's about like, would you just shut up? Okay, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse uh, 11, it says we are to do our own business. When you get a thought, you've got to ask yourself, okay, this thought, is that God's business? Is that my business? Or is that somebody else's business? If it's God's business, throw it back on him. If it's somebody else's business, discard it. It's none of my business. Everybody likes to stick their nose in other people's business. The entire news industry is an industry that makes a living putting their nose in other people's business. And they need it bloodied. Okay, that's what they need. But they make a living at doing that. Now, the common saying is, mind your own business. You have anybody say that to you? Mind your own business. And that's what we need to do. This is the glorious thing we have in our culture of privacy. And I like to be unknowing to people, just to throw them off. You know, where they try, do you approve, do you not approve? Eh. Just to throw them off. Let them think about it. Okay, and so when a thought comes in our mind, we've got to ask ourselves, is there evidence? Okay, there's no evidence, discard it. Thought comes into our mind. Is this my business or is this somebody else's business? Well, somebody else's business, okay, discard it. Boy, it saves a lot of thinking. Just those two things, just to get rid of it. Okay, then what do we do with that? Okay, if you have one, a thought that comes to your mind and you recognize, okay, this is my business, throw it onto God's business. 
Because the Bible says, cast your care upon him, for he careth for you. If you throw that thought on God's business and trust him, recognizing that he will have our best interests at heart. If you focus on the obstacle, like the ten spies, okay, God had Joshua send 12 spies into the land of Canaan. Ten of them focused on the obstacle. Two of them focused on the prize. The ten that focused on the obstacle, what happened to them? They went down to the wilderness of depression, wandered down there, and died. The two that focused on the blessing inherited the blessing and became victorious for God. Okay, now if you analyze your thoughts, if you would go to Jeremiah 20, I'd like to read through this whole chapter. If you analyze your thoughts, and when you get discouraged, you lose a peace of mind. If you're honest with yourself, who are you thinking about? When you analyze your thoughts, and it's taking your peace of mind, I guarantee you are thinking about yourself. That's who you're thinking about. Your hurts, your pain, what they did to me. That's what we're doing. We're thinking about ourselves. As a parent, a lot of times, you know, we're concerned about our kids when they travel. Okay? Throw that on God's business. A lot of times we do that. I do that with Lynn, especially when she bought Mr. Flight last week. <laughs> okay? But that's God's business. Now, Jeremiah chapter 20. I like Jeremiah. <laughs> okay, we're going to read down through these. I want you to analyze, as I analyze, when he's up, when he's down... He has two ups and two downs in the chapter, and notice what he's thinking about when he's up and when he's thinking about when he's down. Jeremiah 20, verse 1. Now, Pastor, the son of Immer, the priest, who was also chief governor in the house of the Lord, heard that Jeremiah prophesied these things. Pastor's a bad guy. Jeremiah's a good guy. Okay, then Pastor smote Jeremiah, the prophet, and put him in stocks that were in the high gate of Benjamin, which was by the house of the Lord. So right outside the Jewish temple, they had these stocks like in the pilgrim's days. Forced him to sit down, put his hands through the stock, put his legs through the stock. People would go by and throw vegetables at him. You know, yell and scream at him. That's what Pastor had Jeremiah do. Wouldn't that be an uplifting day? Okay. Verse 3, and it came to pass on the morrow that Pastor brought forth Jeremiah out of the stock. So he brought him out. Then said Jeremiah unto him, The Lord hath not called thy name Pastor, but Megar Misabib. What a name. Okay, his Pastor, that name means liberty. Okay, no, that, that's, uh, yeah, his name Pastor means liberty. But that big name, Megar Mishabib, means terror on every side. So he's changed his name. Now, this is directed by God. Notice Jeremiah is up. He is confident in the Lord. He said, pal, this is what's going to happen to you. He said, for thus saith the Lord, behold, I will make thee a terror to thyself and to all thy friends, and they shall fall by the sword of their enemies, and thine eyes shall behold it. And I will give all Judah into the hand of the king of Babylon. And he shall carry them away captive into Babylon, and shall slay them with the sword. Moreover, I will deliver all the strength of this city, and all the labors thereof, and all the precious things thereof, and all the treasures of the kings of Judah will I give into the hand of their enemies, which shall spoil them, and take them, and carry them to Babylon." And thou, Pasher, and all that dwell in thine house shall go into captivity, and thou shalt come to Babylon, and there thou shalt die, and shalt be buried there, thou and all thy friends to whom thou hast prophesied lies. Boy, he's pretty confident. History shows us that all that came true. One guy against hundreds and thousands, but in this case, Pasher. Now notice a switch. At the paragraph mark, verse 7, O Lord... Thou hast deceived me, and I was deceived. Thou art stronger than I, and hast prevailed. I am in derision daily. Everyone mocketh me. For since I spake, I cried out. I cried violence as well, because the word of the Lord has made a reproach in me, a derision daily. Then said I, 
I will not make mention of him, nor speak any more in his name. But his word was in mine heart as a burning fire shut up in my bones, and I was weary with forbearing, and I could not stay. Notice all the eyes. Twelve times, I and me, I, me, me, I, I, me, I, I. He's depressed. He's saying, God, you're a liar. You're a liar, and I'm not going to talk about you anymore. He's thinking about himself. He switches, verse 10, paragraph mark. For I heard the defaming of many, fear on every side. Report, say they, we will report it. All my familiars watch for my halting, saying, Peradventure he will be enticed, and we shall prevail against him, and we shall take our revenge on him. But the Lord is with me. Notice who he's thinking about. The Lord is with me as a mighty, terrible one. Therefore my persecutors shall stumble. And they shall not prevail. They shall, not, they shall be greatly ashamed, for they shall not prosper. Their everlasting confusion shall never be forgotten. But, O Lord of hosts, that triest the righteous and seest the reins in the heart, let me see the venge- thy vengeance on them, for unto thee have I opened my cause. Sing unto the Lord, praise you the Lord, for he hath delivered the soul of the poor from the hand of the evildoers. Boy, he's pretty fired up, isn't he? Switch. And this is how quickly words can change us. You get bad news. You were happy. One phone call, bad news, boom. Words are like birds. Fly in and out. Notice what he says. Cursed be the day when I was born. I wish I would never born. Let the day, let not the day wherein my mother bear me be blessed. Cursed be the man that brought tidings to my father, saying, A man child is born unto thee, making him very glad. Let that man be as the cities which the Lord overthrew. Repenteth not. Let him hear the cry in the morning, and let the shout him be at noontide. Because he slew me not from the womb, or that my mother might have been in my grave, and her womb be always great with me. Wherefore came I forth out of the womb to see labor and sorrow, that my days should be consumed with shame. Boy, up and down, right? But notice what he's thinking about each time. When he has his mind on the Lord, he is fired up. When his mind turned inward, he's depressed, discouraged, wants to quit, throw in the towel. He throws his mind back on God, verse 10, verse 11, verse 12, verse 13. He's singing unto God. Verse 13, wish is never born. Cursed be that day. You see, and that's how quick we can turn. And it's words, thoughts that come in our mind. And that's why the Bible tells us, cast down imagination. It's, it's just an imagination. Cast it down. And then go to Philippians chapter 4, verse 6, and think on these things. If you would, go to Isaiah 26, verse 3. How can a person tell if you have a peace of mind? And again, I know we all are going to fail. This is a battle we have every single day. All of us, back and forth. It's like bird flying everywhere. Okay? And like I said, you can't help it if a bird lands on your head. You can't help it if a bird drops some poo on you. But you can wipe it off. And she don't have to build a nest in it. Pain is inevitable. Misery is optional. Isaiah 26, verse 3, he says this, Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusteth in thee. Trust ye in the Lord forever, for in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. He gave us that hint in 1 Peter where he said in 1 Peter, be not afraid of their terror. And 15, he says, sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. That's where our mind is stayed on him. And then Philippians 4, verse 6, 6, think on these things. How do we know if we've got there? When you have joy, when you can praise God, when you have a rejoicing, when you have a heart that's grateful, you have some thanksgiving, 
where you've got happiness welling up within. And that becomes Christ's likeness. And that's a struggle we all face. And so the thing is, is cast those imaginations down. When you have these thoughts, say, I'm dead to those thoughts. The Lord is not telling us not to deal with things. But when you have those thoughts and there's no evidence, cast the thought down. If it's about a party, instead of thinking bad about that, how about praying for them? If you're worried about something, how about taking that God? Throw it back on him, because that's his business. That's his business. Casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. And we know, according to what this book says, God has our best interests at heart. He's got your kids' best interests at heart. And the thing is, is cast down these things, give them in God's hand, trust in him, and ask him to help us think on the right things. Philippians 4, verse 8. Okay, let's pray. Lord, I do pray that you'd help us recognize that you do want us to have a peace of mind and we can have peace in the midst of a storm. Like you did on that day that storm was going and the disciples were rowing and rowing and fearing and yelling and screaming, having a panic attack and all that stuff. And you were sleeping in the back of the boat. And Lord, I do pray you'd help us to have that peace of mind because, because we trust in thee. And when we fail, and as we all will every single day, I do pray that you'd help us to have our thoughts focused on thee and analyze the thought, find out whose business it's, it, it is. If it's yours, give it back to you. If it's, if it's somebody else's, just discard it. And if it's our business, help us to throw that back on you. And Lord, then we can trust you. And have a peace of mind, have a joy in our hearts. And Lord, I pray you'd help us realize that the circumstances that are about us should not affect our relationship with thee, that we might have this peace of mind so that our mind can be perfectly stayed on thee. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Okay, word is.